A sex offender enrolled in a local high school. That stunning discovery first reported by Fox 45 News one year ago. But as Project Baltimore's Chris Papps explains, we still don't know everyone in Baltimore County Schools who allowed it to happen. To get that answer, we filed a public records request for emails sent by certain school employees regarding sex offenders. It took a year and nearly $600 to get the emails. But much of what we received was blacked out. It was a decision that was supported. Who supported it? A whole bunch of different people. That was former county schools communication specialist Brandon Olin. Last February, when Fox 45 asked why Santino Sudano, a 21-year-old registered sex offender, was allowed to attend Parkville High School. Sudano is now back behind bars, accused of sexually assaulting two more underage girls, one of them a fellow Parkville student. So you're standing by your decision? This was the right decision at the time? I think what we're talking about today is what we're going to do going forward. County schools never answered our questions about who in the administration supported the decision to allow a sex offender into a school with teenage girls. So in February 2020, one year ago, Project Baltimore filed a public records request for emails sent by county schools employees regarding Sudano and similar situations. County schools denied the request and gave us nothing. My goal is always to try to reach a practical uh, solution that will be satisfactory to both sides, that they can both agree to. Lisa Kirshner, Maryland's public records ombudsman, worked with Project Baltimore and the school system to reach an agreement. Nine months and nearly $600 later, Project Baltimore received a few hundred emails. And this is what we found. In some cases, entire pages redacted. In others, just one sentence. I have seen this before. Attorney Scott Martyr of Thomas and Leibowitz represented Fox 45 News in a public records lawsuit against Baltimore City Schools, a lawsuit Project Baltimore won in March 2019, when a judge found city schools willfully and knowingly violated the law by withholding public documents. Martyr says blacking out entire pages raises red flags. I can't evaluate it when all I see is black. I, I don't have enough information to be able to say yes or no, this should be exempt or it shouldn't. The burden is on the government agency to establish the basis for the exemption. In this email, for example, County Schools Chief of Staff Michael Dickerson responds to a co-worker concerning an email I sent requesting an interview with Project Baltimore. Dickerson writes, we will not do an on-camera interview. But the next sentence is redacted. What did he say? We can't read it. This email with the subject Fox 45 request is from Christina Byers, the community superintendent who oversees Parkville High School. She is writing the chief of staff and Parkville principal Maureen Astorita. But the entire email is redacted. We can't read one word of it. Same thing with this email sent from county schools to County Executive Johnny Olszewski's office. When government agencies make these kind of redactions, it raises questions in my mind as to why they're doing it. And I push, I want more information because I don't think that their response to you has provided enough information to meet their burden under the exemption. Despite help from the public records ombudsman, there were 10 additional emails from the chief of staff and superintendent's office that county schools refused to give us. We were told they were confidential. The header information to, from, date, all of that should be produced unredacted. The body of it, it depends on what's in there. But we can't evaluate it without them giving more information. We have emailed Baltimore County Schools asking for more information on why certain sentences or entire emails were blacked out. When we hear back, we'll let you know. At 10 o'clock, exclusive new information about the murder of an MTA mobility bus driver. His name was Frankie Duckett. And tonight, Fox 45 News has confirmed police are reviewing new video evidence in that case. Keith Daniels is live right now with those new developments in a story you're seeing first on Fox. Keith. 
Well, guys, sources close to this case have confirmed that this video is part of the Duckett homicide investigation. Now, the video is so graphic that we're only showing a small part of it. Still tonight, a warning. It could be disturbing. No, don't do that, no. The video is blurry, but you can see Frankie Duckett shot and killed. Before the gunfire, he's seen getting in the bus, then heard pleading for his life. The shooter sticks his arm and gun through the window. The deadly shooting of the MTA mobility driver caught on a bus surveillance camera. The images heartbreaking for his family. No one deserves to die like that. Still, they say they want the public to see what happened. You can look at that and you can say, oh my God, that could have been my brother or that could have been my husband. So it, the visual is important because it brings a light on it. You know, it makes it real. It was one of the most gruesome videos I've seen and I've seen a lot. TJ Smith is a law enforcement expert. He's seen the entire video, how the suspect repeatedly fired at Duckett, killing him. Smith has a profile of the suspected murderer. That's not, in my opinion, a rookie killer um, or rookie trigger puller. You're seeing a killer who had zero regard for another individual's life, period. Police say Marquise Potit is the shooting suspect. He's on the loose. Investigators say it all started when Duckett picked up an elderly woman, Potit's grandmother, on Mulberry Street last Friday. There was an argument between the men. Duckett's family members say they were told surveillance video from the bus shows the argument started when Duckett told Potit he couldn't come on the bus without wearing a mask. Duckett then drove away and dropped the woman off at an apartment. Police say Poteet got Ernest Ford, who's been arrested, to drive him to find Duckett. And when they found him, police say Poteet shot him before taking off with Ford. And tonight, the shooting, caught on camera, made public. If they can see how painful, how destructive this is, it'll make you think, you know, if I know this guy, let me... Let me turn this guy in. Well, if you have any information as to where Marquise Poteet might be, you're urged to call police. Is in hot water with the city tonight, accused of scrapping vehicles that were never supposed to be. Jeff Abel live tonight with the story for us, Jeff. You know, it was just four months ago we told you about a towing company that was overbilling the city, and now we're learning about another towing company that was supposed to be impounding vehicles, but instead has been selling them for scrap. Another towing company with the city's coveted medallion status is now accused of driving city business down the wrong road. Three separate times it was called by police to tow accident vehicles to the city's impound lot. But according to an inspector general's investigation, all three vehicles had been scrapped. The person that had towed it to his yard, he received $300 per car. So he made $900. By law, the towing company is supposed to provide owners 30 days notice before scrapping a vehicle. But the inspector general says that happened just once in these three cases. Instead, the Enterprise Rental Car Company, which owned all three vehicles, was forced to pay $5,000 to get its own vehicles That's, back. Has it happened in the past? I think if we did an investigation, we might find it has. In this case, the inspector general's report says the vendor's inability to comply with contractual guidelines leaves the city open for lawsuits. Now the company's services are suspended. But what worries me is it could happen to our citizens, and that's who I don't want this to happen to. Well, that suspended towing company has yet to be identified. The city is now trying to decide whether to bar it from doing business with the city ever again.